All right, so uh, welcome back everyone. And um, let's continue with lecture one here. This will be the last section. Uh, so here we're gonna talk about the rational numbers and the algebraic numbers, which is sort of an extension of the rational numbers. And this is kind of our stepping stone towards the real numbers. And we're gonna kind of motivate, uh, you know, what's wrong with the rational numbers? Why do we need the real numbers and so on, okay? So first some notation. Um, so we use the symbol Z, kind of a blackboard bold Z to indicate the set of all integers. So that's basically, it's like the natural numbers, but it has negative numbers, zero, and then the normal nat uh, natural numbers as well. Um, so that's the, integers and then q like is in quotient um, is the set of rational numbers so i'm going to use this notation here so m and n are in the integers and n is not equal to zero. <clears throat> so let me just explain this notation for a second because it's very important that everyone understand exactly how this works. So what this means, what this notation means is that this, the, it's called set builder notation. The sort of expression on the left side is basically a description of what the elements of the set are, okay? So in this case, the elements of Q are these fractions, okay, which consist of two integers, one over the other, the top one being the numerator, the lower one being the denominator. And so then the, everything to the right of the, of the vertical bar is sort of a description of the properties that the things on the left have, okay? So in this case, what, what it means is um, M and N have to be integers, so they can be positive or negative, except the bottom one can't be zero, okay? I mean, this is all familiar stuff, I'm sure, but I just want to um, use this as kind of a toy example for explaining how set builder notation works for those of you who aren't familiar with it because it's really very important, okay? So this is the set of all, you know, fractions of integers where the denominator is not zero. And uh, now the, you know, we, we axiomatized the natural numbers, right? Uh, with Piano's axioms. In this case, we're actually gonna skip doing the same thing for the integers and for the rational numbers, mainly because all the important axioms of those systems become axioms of the real number system later. So when we get to the real numbers, you'll kind of see all of the axioms that are sort of important here. Um, so all, all I'm gonna really do is just describe basically, you know, why the rational numbers are not quite sufficient. Okay, so why is that? Okay, so let's, Let's look, look at this. Um, why is Q not enough? It's probably a little bit obvious to some of you, or maybe all of you, um, that some numbers are not rational, right? I mean, what this really means, philosophically, it's sort of nonsense to say this, but, but what, what I really mean by this is that there are numbers that we, it would be useful, useful to be able to talk about, right? In reality, it seems like there are basically quantities which arise in nature, which cannot be described as a rational number, right? So the really familiar examples of this are, you know, the square root of two, pi, e, and to kind of put this in, uh, <clears throat> to put this in perspective, right? Um, we would like to be able to say that the graph of the function f of x equals x squared minus two meets the x-axis, right? So without the number square root of two, this would not be true. There would be no intersection, right? 
which is kind of an insane idea. I mean, if you just look at the graph, look at the picture, it clearly crosses it, right? So there should be some point of intersection. Um, and also, you know, we would like to be able to say a circle has a well defined circumference. Right? If you take a circle with radius one half, I guess, then the circumference of that should be pi, right? So if pi doesn't exist, then that circle has no circumference. So these are obviously problems, and that's those are problems that the real number system tries to uh, compensate or tries to rectify. Okay. Um, let me think. Is that everything? Right. Um, so let's. Uh, Let's talk about the algebraic numbers, which are sort of an extension of the rational numbers. They're one step towards trying to fill in, right? So what you can see here is that basically the rational number system, it's kind of counterintuitive because the rational numbers, there are infinitely many of them and they get super close together, right? They kind of like fit, make their own line um, where you can find between any two rational numbers, you could find infinitely more rational numbers, right? They're just really dense. They get really densely packed together into this line. But what we're seeing from this example here is that even within that line, there are still lots of numbers missing. There are kind of like little gaps, basically, like little infinitely small gaps. Like this graph kind of slips through a gap on the x-axis, basically, right? So we're trying to fix that. Um, this idea of gaps, that, that, that terminology or phrasing kind of comes back later when we talk about the real numbers. So I, that's why I want to introduce it here. So let's talk about the algebraic numbers. So sometimes people write this as like an A like that. Uh, we're not really going to need that notation, but just for, for educational purposes. Uh, that's one way of writing it. So these are the numbers. So these are the numbers you can get from uh, Q with plus minus times divides, you know, these operations as well as square rooting, taking square roots, this is called root extraction. So taking nth roots, basically. So any expressions you can build up with these operations and rational numbers will constitute an algebraic number. This is a very informal way of defining these, obviously. But uh, it works for our purposes. So uh, as examples, right, um, 4 over 17, these are just from the book. But this is obviously algebraic because it's just a rational number, right? Or something like the spirit of 2, our favorite algebraic number that's happens not to be rational, right? Uh, or something uh, more complicated like, um, you know, the cube root of 17, or even better, something like two plus the cube root of five, all under here, right? You can get more complicated expressions like that. Those are all algebraic numbers. So these are algebraic. Um, notably, actually, pi and e, two of our favorite numbers ever, are actually not algebraic, um, although it's kind of hard to show. But so the algebraic numbers uh, still aren't good enough, actually, uh, amazingly. But it's still worthwhile to look at them a little bit. So uh, one question that's kind of important is, how can we tell if an algebraic number is rational, right? Uh, this is where a theorem called the rational zeros theorem comes in. And this is going to be basically the last topic for this lecture. Uh, so let me just kind of describe to you the sort of process here when it comes to determining whether a given algebraic number is actually rational, okay? What you do is you take your algebraic number 
and you find a polynomial that that algebraic number is a root of, right? So a polynomial so that when you plug in your algebraic number, you get zero. Once you have that polynomial, this rational zeros theorem, which I'm about to describe to you, will tell you what rational numbers can be zeros of that polynomial. There are only a couple that you can even, that, that are, could even possibly be zeros of the polynomial, okay? And the rational zeros theorem tells you. So if you go through all those possibilities of what rational roots there are and find that none of them are roots or like maybe a couple of them are roots, but obviously those, thing, those rational roots are not equal to your algebraic number, then that shows that the algebraic number can't be rational, right? So, um, so let me state the theorem for you and then we'll do a few examples, okay? So here's the rational zeros theorem. I'm just gonna state it. So if cn x to the n plus c n minus one x to the n minus one plus all the way up to c one x plus c zero is a polynomial with integer coefficients. So that means cn, cn minus one, c one and c zero, all, all of those ci's are integers. And um, r is a rational root where c over d is in lowest terms, obviously, right? So this is a rational number, which is a root, uh, and we've written it in lowest terms, then uh, C divides, I believe, yeah, C zero, and D divides, so it means it's a factor, uh, divides CN, okay? So, um, let's just look at a couple examples of just applying the rational zeros theorem to a polynomial, right? So uh, for example, well, let me think for a sec. Sure, okay. Um, the only possible, the only possible keyword possible rational roots of x squared minus two are plus or minus one and plus or minus two, right? Because the coefficient of x squared is one. So that's kind of the denominator here. And then obviously the constant term is negative two. So the only factors of negative two are like plus, or, I mean, up to a sign. So the plus and minus signs kind of don't matter here, but plus or minus one and plus or minus two are like the only factors here. So what you can do um, is say that, well, well, neither of these are actually roots, right? So So x squared minus two has no rational roots. Right? No other rational number could be a root. Just That's just by the rational zeros there. Has no rational roots. So square root of two, which we know is a root, right? Can't be rational. That means it's irrational. Okay, I'm skipping the proof of the rational zeros theorem just because it's not like very complicated and it's also probably not very, uh, and it's not very difficult, but it's not, also, not very useful. Um, so, um, so that's one kind of very simple example. Let's do one more slightly more complicated example. So applying the rational zero theorem. Um, to show square root of two plus cube root of five is irrational, okay? 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down a polynomial that this number satisfies, right? Like I said, you find a polynomial that the algebraic number is a root of, and then you enumerate the possible rational zeros using the rational zero theorem. So um, square root of two plus the cube root of five is a root of, see the polynomial is a little bit complicated, right? It's um, x to the sixth minus 6x to the fourth plus 12x squared minus 13 equals zero. Well, I mean, whatever. It's a root of this polynomial, right? Um, so by the rational zero theorem, the only possible rational roots are plus or minus one and plus or minus 13, right? Those are the only factors of this. And then this, again, this is one, <clears throat> one. So the denominators here are just factors of one, right? So none of these are roots again. So the, so this, which is a root, has to be rational, okay? So with that, you might be wondering, where did I get that polynomial, okay? I wanna give you guys a chance to think about that a little bit yourself, and then I'll explain it here in a second, okay? But I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do here is give you the first lecture question of the semester. So this is lecture one, question one. Um, so find a polynomial for which square root of two minus the cube root of five is a root and then use the rational zeros theorem to enumerate the zeros. Okay. Oops. So um, please uh, pause the video, think about this, give it your best shot. It's okay if you don't get it right. Um, write down whatever you can and submit that as part of the homework. So um, yeah, pause. All right, now I'll, uh, now I'll uh, go through this and explain, okay? So, let's see. So, let's see, I don't know, answer. Um, <clears throat> set, so let's write B equals square root of two minus cube root of five, okay? Then, so what we kind of want to do, the general process is just kind of like undo the operations that exist in this expression, right? So b squared, this is just algebra. So b squared is two minus cube root of five, right? So um, two minus b squared is the cube root of five. So, two minus b squared cubed is five. So two minus b squared cubed minus five is zero. Now, if you kind of uh, expand this, you get um, b, oops. So b is a root of the polynomial, I have this written down, x to the sixth minus 6x to the fourth plus 12x squared minus 3. Uh, and the rational zeros theorem says 
the only possible rational roots are plus or minus one and plus or minus three. And if you plug it in, I'm pretty sure none of, the, none of those are roots. Even if one of these was a root, okay, for some reason, uh, let's just imagine that that happened. Then, um, let me think, yeah. Then all you have to do is take the ones that actually are roots. Like let's say one, the number one was a root for some reason, okay, even though it isn't. Um, let's imagine that one was a root, okay? Then all you have to do is just argue that the original b, two, which is the square root of two minus q root of five, is not equal to one, okay? And that's usually pretty easy to do. You just sort of set up an equation maybe and do some operations and show that it's like not possible that, that, that those two things are actually equal to each other, okay? So in the end of the day, all, what you're doing is basically showing that none of the rational roots of this polynomial are equal to b. So that means B can't be rational because it's clearly a root of the polynomial by construction, okay? Uh, okay, anyway, so that's, uh, that's all for the rational numbers, algebraic numbers, and the rational zeros theorem. Um, and uh, that concludes lecture one. So I'll see you guys again in the next lecture. Thank you.